And um, so today I want to read from a profile which will um, introduce our guest speaker. Dr. Carl Safina works to show, oh, first, before I do that, I want to say what's going to happen today. Uh, Dr. Safina will be in Prentice, and he's, got, he has a, he's written a lot of books and some brochures about um, the Blue Ocean Institute. So he'll be sitting in there and having lunch, and you can come meet him. You can come buy a book. You can come look at the books, come meet him and talk about any issues. So following C and D period, we'll be down in the, in the Prentice area, area. So come see him there. Dr. Carl Safina works to show why nature and human dignity require each other. Much of his writing illuminates how the ocean is changing and what the changes mean for wildlife and people. His recent works probe the scientific, moral, and social dimensions of our relationship with the natural world. His early research focuses on seabird ecology. In the 1990s, he brought fisheries issues into the environmental mainstream, helping lead campaigns to ban drift nets, overhaul U.S. fisheries law, strengthen international conservation of tunas, sharks, and other fishes, and achieve a United Nations fisheries treaty. Safina, whose doctorate in ecology is from Rutgers University, is the author of six books and more than 100 scientific and popular publications, including features in National Geographic and the New York Times and a new for, for, forward, no forward to Rachel Carson's The Sea Around Us. His book, first book, Song for the Blue Ocean, was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year and a Los Angeles Times Best Nonfiction Selection and a Library Journal Best Science Book selection. It won him the Lenin Literary Award for nonfiction. His second book, Eye of the Albatross, won the John Burroughs Medal and the National Academy's Communication Award for, this year's best, for the year's best book. Dr. Safina's Voyage of the Turtle was a New York Times editor's choice. He published his first children's book in 2010. Safina has a profile on Nightline and in the New York Times named among 100 notable conservationists of the 20th century by Audubon magazine, and he's been featured on Bill Moyers' PBS special, Earth on special, The Earth on Edge. He has an honorary doctorate from the State University of New York and Long Island University. He's also president of the nonprofit Blue Ocean Institute and is an adjunct professor at Stony Brook University. Safina is also a MacArthur Fellow, a Guggenheim Fellow, a Pew Fellow, and a recipient of Chicago's Brookfield Zoo's RAB Medal. Among other honor honors, he hosts Saving the Ocean on PBS television. So please join me in wel warmly welcoming Dr. Carl Safina. OK, thank you. Very good. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Okay, good, good. All right, now, we're, um, I want to talk about something that is very, very narrow and very, very focused, the world and you. We're going to try to answer these questions quickly. What's our relationship with the natural world? What should that relationship be? And how does our relationship with the natural world affect our relationship with one another. Small little focused questions, as I said. All right, um, you all heard a very, very nice introduction of me and um, all these great things and awards and everything like that. But um, here's who I really am. Really, I'm a kid who likes to go fishing. And I just got older, that's all. But that's really who I am. And um, when I got to be a little bit less of a kid, I had to figure out what I was going to do if I grew up. Uh, so I didn't want to grow up, and I looked around very carefully to find out how you can avoid growing up, because all the grown-ups I knew uh, had jobs they didn't like, and I didn't want to grow up and have a job I didn't like. So I found a very interesting way to avoid adulthood. It's called graduate school. <laughs> and I think that you should all go there. Because I did, and in graduate school, they let me continue to go out in boats. In fact, they gave me a much better boat than I had ever owned before. And they said that I could study seabirds for a living. So that's what I did. Now, although I'm going to talk to you mainly through an ocean lens, because I'm a kid who likes to go fishing, 
really we are going to talk about these major issues about our relationship with the world. But I want to show you how I got there. I enjoyed going fishing. I started to see that the fishing seemed to be getting worse and worse, and I was wondering what was going on. And then I found out that things were happening in the ocean that were unimaginable to me in their scale and their effect. Like there were really, really big boats out there being very good at what they were doing, which was trying to find what lives the, in the ocean and removing it. And it made a big difference. On that bottom right uh, image is 20 tons of a fish called orange ruffy. Ha have any of the students here ever seen orange ruffy on a menu? No. One? Are you a student? No, you lied. Okay. Now that's the point though. The point is that, the, is that about 20 years ago they were on a lot of menus and they were really very cop common and popular. No young people know what this fish is and that's because we ate them all. If you look at this guy's catch, can you tell what he's trying to fish for? Raise a hand if you have an idea. Shrimp. shrimp, yes, he's fishing for shrimp. And if you look very carefully, you could see that he caught one. <laughs> I try to get my pointer here. There it is, he caught one. Um, and all the rest of these fish die and they get swept overboard dead. That's shrimp fishing. Even better, in a lot of places in the world, people simply throw bombs off their boats to stun the fish or they squirt poison in the coral to stun the fish. That works really well unless you have to come back next week um, or you need food or you have kids. <laughs> this is what's happened to the ocean over the course of my lifetime. Around the time when I was born, almost nothing in the ocean was considered crashed and now about a third of it is. And around the time when I was born, a lot of the ocean was considered underexploited and now basically none of it is. And even though this started when I was born, it is not my fault. <laughs> Another way of looking at it is that there were once a lot of things in the ocean and there were a lot of big fish, now there are far fewer. Most of them are smaller. And the seafloor is, is very simplified by, by dragging nets back and forth across it all the time. In some places, particular areas of the seafloor get hit with a net more than a dozen times a year, where the net just drags across everything. Now what I've shown you is what people catch, but what you don't see is that what they catch is not only what's there now, it's what should be there in the future. They catch options. Basically, they catch your world. They catch the world you have to live in. So I should say, I should say, in case you can't figure out what's going on here, this is a shark called a dogfish, and they happen to stay pregnant longer than any other animal known, even longer than elephants. It takes them almost two years to complete their pregnancy. She just died in this net, and she's giving birth, actually giving birth, right here just after she's died. So what is the ocean supposed to look like and what is the whole world supposed to look like? Well, how are you supposed to know? How could you tell? Everybody thinks the world is supposed to look like it looked when you first got there and you had to look around. But it used to be very different. If you don't know what it used to be like, you can't have a reasonable argument over what sort of policies to pursue, should you let something recover, how much should you leave, what should, what should things get back to? How would, you, how would you even begin to talk about that? This is a little hard to see because it's all black and white, but what this is is the same boat at the same dock in Florida over four decades. And this is what they caught. 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1990s. See a difference? 
This is not just about fish. It's about people who need fish. People obviously want them. That's why they're taking so many. But then when you take all of them, you don't have any. That's a sort of a paradox. My thing is it's OK to use nature. We, we, you know, we are of nature. Nature is why we're here. Uh, but you can't use it up, because if you use it up, you have none. It used to be that the only things that could cause mass extinctions or could alter the climate were gigantic natural forces like asteroid strikes, uh, large amounts of volcanic activity, those kinds of things. But now people do that too. People have become truly a force of nature. We affect everything about the world and we also affect the options of people who are young and the options of people who are not yet even conceived, people who will be here in the future. If you look out at the world, you know, you look up in the sky or you go to the ocean, you look at the ocean, everything seems really big and really vast. And that is a misperception. If you take all the water in the ocean and you make one big drop out of it. That's the picture on the left. That's all the water in the ocean. If you put the water back in the ocean and you take the air and you make one bubble out of the air, that's that pink bubble. That's all the air that there is. So we think that we live on this planet that is the water planet. The ocean is so deep. But if you look at the depth of the ocean, about two miles, compared to the um, diameter of the Earth 8,000 miles, what you realize is that we really live on a marble with not enough water to wet the whole surface and a tiny film of gas around it. That's the world. If you look at the ocean, you think it's also so vast, how could anybody ever affect it compared to the forests and fresh water and things like that? But we're very good at going anywhere now and getting what we want to get. And if you look at the declines of species over all these different um, uh, habitats, they're all declining at about the same rate. Now, I find those graphs pointing downward very alarming. But a lot of people simply don't. And I've wondered for a long time, why is it that what seems to me like the destruction of the whole world doesn't seem like a bad idea? to most people and most of our institutions. And I think it's because we run the world with ideas that were developed before we understood anything about how the world actually works. And that means that our institutions are literally out of sync with reality. Here's part of what I mean. If you look at the ideas with which we run the world, mostly religious ideas and religious values, Western philosophies, Eastern philosophies, and our economic system, capitalism, you realize that they were all fully developed before anybody understood anything about the fact that the world changes, before anybody knew anything about natural systems and natural cycles, Nobody understood anything about how the atmosphere is composed, how it works, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the water cycle, the, the finiteness of forests and fresh water, um, all of these kinds of things. Nobody even knew that the way the world looks right now isn't the way the world always looked. They just, they, they didn't know anything about geology. They didn't know that the surface of the earth changes. They didn't know anything about the basis for biology. And what we've learned, we've learned only in about the last 150 years. We've learned almost everything about how the world works. Right at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution was right about the same time that a guy who was one of the first astronomers, he spent 40 years making lenses to look deeper and deeper into space, came up with the, with the thought that seeing farther and farther into space implies deep time in the universe. And no one had ever before that had any way of trying to guess how old anything is. We didn't know anything. Now we know something, but the way we operate hasn't caught up or corresponded to what we actually have learned. 
And the problem with that is that it really shows. Now, things are changing very fast. By the middle of this century, we're supposed to add another 2 billion people. And I wonder if that is going to be even possible. And I don't think it's going to be very pleasant for most of the people in the world. You hear all the time about growth. We always have to be growing. We hear every day about whether the economy has grown, how much the economy has grown, everything has to grow. Well, people seem to be very confused about the difference between growth and development. Growth means taking more material and making something bigger. Development means making something better. You can treat each other better. You can have better education. You can have better hospitals, uh, you can have better communities without them being bigger. But people seem to think that being bigger and being better is the same. It's not the same, and sometimes those two things are very much at odds with one another. Now, in my work tends to be about the oceans, looking at the world from the standpoint of how the oceans are changing and what it means for the wildlife of the oceans and the people of the oceans. One of the birds, I, I really like seabirds a lot, and the extreme seabird are the albatrosses. Um, they, are, they have the biggest wings in nature. That is about natural size for that bird. They're like, um, they're like little airplanes when, when you're sitting in their nesting area and they're coming flying around. They're also the most endangered family of birds because they get into trouble with our fisheries and our fisheries were killing so many of them that there were a lot of albatrosses that looked like they were threatened with extinction. They get hooked on these lines that are 25 to 50 miles long. They, the lines get let out the back of a boat. They have thousands of baited hooks and the albatrosses come in trying to grab the bait off the hook before the line sinks out of reach. But if you see on this boat, here is the line, miles and miles of this line with thousands of hooks, and there are the birds, but the birds are not where the bait is. And by the time the line is over here where the birds are, it's too deep and they can't get it. And that's because there's a piece of rope here with a splashing buoy and some streamers and another one here and this problem that was endangering albatrosses around the world is solved with two pieces of rope. More sea turtles drown in shrimp nets than die from any other cause and it turns out that if you put something like a barbecue grill in a shrimp net and have a flap the turtle can slide out and the shrimp can go through. Problem solved with a barbecue grill. But those aren't the only problems. Some of the problems are much more complicated. Besides taking a lot out, we put a lot of things in. Those things are in different um, categories. Nice things like nutrients. Nutrients, if you think of nutrients as food, it's mostly fertilizer that we're talking about. Everybody needs food and food is good, but there is such a thing as too much of it and too much of it can make you sick. Same with these nutrients that go into the ocean. Same with toxic chemicals that are never really good for you except in tiny, tiny traces sometimes. Same with um, things like uh, hormones that we have now coming through us and going back out into the water in the form of uh, birth control pills and other things like that that actually mess up other animals. We live um, in many different ways as human beings on this earth, but there are still a lot of people, including people in America, who live right around the same level in the food chain as polar bears. There are American citizens, they live in Alaska and they eat a lot of seals. And um, just as the polar bears get contaminated with all the contaminants that go up in the air, go down in the water, get concentrated in the food chain, same thing with these people. It's not their fault, they didn't try to start these problems, they don't really contribute that much to these problems, but they tend to suffer the most. Another thing about the way the world works, unfortunately, is that usually they say, you know, what goes around comes around, and it usually kind of does, but it comes around first to the poorest. 
the poorest and the, uh, and the non-humans among us always get the worst of it first. Now we have this other big problem, which is we're changing the entire heat balance of the world with all of the uh, fossil fuel combustion of the last 200 years. Here is the carbon dioxide as measured in Hawaii, out in the middle of the ocean, get far, far away from most population centers. And you'll notice that the carbon dioxide goes up and down and up and down and up and down every year, although it mainly goes up and up. So why does it go down every single year? Who knows? What? Summer. Most of the land and most of the forest and most of the vegetative growth is in the northern hemisphere. So when it's summer in the north, all of the plant growing actually draws carbon dioxide out and down from the atmosphere. And you can see it. This is sensitive enough to show it. But you can also see that overall the net, um, the net change is more. You see more of the change at the poles. You don't see most of the change where most people live, although that is starting to change. We had Superstorm Sandy last year. We just had the Super Typhoon this year. That's starting to change. But if you go to the polar places, you see enormous, enormous change. At this glacier in a place called Svalbard, north of Norway, used to be hundreds of feet thick. And we walked up the side of this valley 500 feet in elevation before we got to the first little plants because, uh, and there was a bathtub ring all the way around the valley because that glacier was once 200 feet thicker than it is now. It was also several miles down that valley. When you go to the polar regions, the change is not subtle. It's very, very obvious. Most of, much of the heat is actually going into the ocean the heat is not changing as much in the atmosphere because the ocean is absorbing a lot of it. And that's one of the reasons that things are melting at the poles. So things are changing for penguins and for the things penguins eat, like krill, which need to graze on the underside of the sea ice. So if there's no sea ice, no food for the krill, no krill, no food for the penguins. Also, um, you may have heard of the problem with the polar bears are having. They eat seals at their breathing holes. And if the sea doesn't freeze, no ice, no breathing holes, no food for the polar bears. You might think that the seals like this, but the seals give birth on the ice. So there's no winner in that situation. And although you may have heard of polar bears being in trouble, you probably have never heard of most of these animals. They're as doomed as polar bears if the ice goes away because they're also totally reliant on ice. There are also a lot of people who are still alive who happen to be totally reliant on ice. This is the mayor of a town in Alaska. His people have, these are um, a, a type of Eskimos and Nupiats. These people are uh, living in a place that they've lived for about 600 years or more. They say 3,000 years. And it's, it's a barrier beach island. It's like, it's like the beach on the south shore of Long Island. It's a barrier beach. The ocean is here. That's the bay. And the continent, the mainland of Alaska, is here. It used to be the ocean froze in the winter. And then they have these shrieking storms. But the ice armored the place and armored the ocean. Now the ocean doesn't freeze anymore. So when the storms come, they just sweep the houses away. They've lost 16 houses in the last storm. And this town needs to move. Where do they need to move? They need to move right across the bay. No one else lives there. This is their hunting territory and their summer um, gathering territory. No one lives there. Everybody says, if you need to move, just fine, move. They have one problem. They need about $150 million to move because they have to build houses for 600 American citizens they have to build a school. They have to build a post office, an airstrip, and a power plant. They need money to move. They didn't create this problem, so they need $150 million. They live in a state where well, the oil companies who take the oil out of the state make billions and billions and billions of dollars. No one wants to give them anything. So if 600 Americans cannot move five miles across a bay to a place where no one contests their right to do that, what is going to happen when millions of people 
in Bangladesh or Southeast Asia or New York City or the Philippines need to move a few miles to get away from the water because it's ruining their farms and it's, it's ruining their wells. What's going to happen when they move right on top of millions of other people who are already poor and don't have room for them? These people are in Palau, a island nation in the middle of the uh, West Pacific. They're getting flooded every time there's a new moon or a full moon. This didn't happen 15 years ago. It started 15 years ago. This woman is 80 years old. Her entire farm is ruined because the tide comes in. Now it's all full of salt. What is this 80-year-old woman going to do? Coral reefs are subject to extra heat that they can't take. You think they would like it because they live in warm water. They can't take it. This is a new problem since the 70s, 1970s. When carbon dioxide gets in the atmosphere, not only does the warmth go into the ocean, actually the carbon dioxide itself goes into the ocean. It creates a change that lowers the pH. It's called ocean acidification. And if you do some laboratory studies, you see that a change in pH from what it is now, which is about 8.1 to about 7.5 or 7.7, um, dissolves baby clams and kills sea urchin larva. That's where things are headed. So what's going to happen to all these people who need those things or who need coral reefs? Corals are growing slower because of the acidification. The acidification tends to dissolve the corals also. What's going to happen to all of these people? We are the most privileged people in the history of the world. We can pretty much do what we want. We will not run out of food in the foreseeable future. We have lots of options and lots of choices. We are in the extreme, extreme minority because for about a third of everybody in the world, they have zero options. They take what we do for them or what we do to them. They are at our mercy. That's their life. This guy's name was Aldo Leopold, and he was a scientist. He wrote an incredibly important book called The Sand County Almanac back in the 1940s. And even though he was a scientist, he understood that facts come from science, but that ethics and morality comes from facts. You can't know what's right to do unless you know what's really going on. Science tells us what's really going on, and then it's up to us to decide, based on what's really going on, what is right to do. Now, I want to just switch gears a little bit here and go back to my friends, the albatrosses, because they've taught me something really important too. They've taught me we are not the only creatures, not the only beings on earth who care about each other. They care about each other. We're not the only ones, not the only ones who care about our children. They care about their children. This is the actual satellite track of an albatross with a chick in a nest here. This is the entire North Pacific Ocean. That's San Francisco. This is Canada. This is the Aleutian Islands. This is Hawaii. These are the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. That's Russia. This is the entire North Pacific Ocean. To get one meal for her chick, she goes 9,000 miles over almost a month. She flies more than 1,000 miles up to this area where the cold water meets the warm water. She finds a lot of food right here and is going around in circles, comes out of it, Little food there, a lot of food here. This is an important place for food. It's an important fishing area. A lot of tuna, a lot of turtles congregate there. A lot of food here for her, mostly squid. She comes back day after day after day, makes a right turn and goes about a thousand miles down to a nest in an island that's half a mile wide. Human beings cannot do this at all. We, we're very proud of ourselves because we think we can do all these things that animals can't do. Well, animals can do a lot of things that people can't do. They deserve our respect and they deserve our consideration. She comes back after flying 9,000 miles for a month to feed this chick that is very hungry, 
Her mate is doing the same thing, so the chick is probably getting fed about once every two weeks. They live farther from any continent than any islands in the world, and this is what it looks like there. You don't have albatrosses all over your backyard, but they have a lot of garbage all over their backyard. And when she comes back from this trip, she feeds the chick not just food, she feeds the chick a lot of plastic that she's found floating. There's probably some things growing on the plastic, like fish eggs or edible barnacles. That's probably why she swallowed it, but the chick gets all of it. This chick was about six months old and was just about to fly, but it died. It was packed with cigarette lighters. Now, this is not the relationship we're supposed to have with the world. It's not the relationship we want to have with the world, but it is the relationship we really do have with the world. Because we, who've named ourselves after our big brains and so, so proud of the fact that we're so smart, we don't think. And this is not just an idea. To these animals, this is pain, it's suffering, and it is death. Are we stuck with these problems? Do we have to ride them out to the bitter end? Do we have to actually destroy everything around us because we're stuck in this system now? No, we don't. We've had a lot of other things that we've confronted and we've thought our way out of it in the past. The first offshore oil wells were called whales. People weren't thinking about us then and they killed almost all of the whales. Now we have oil 2.0. The second set of offshore wells is petroleum. We're not thinking about the future either. I thought my generation would. We haven't. We have not only failed, we've been totally reckless. We hear that we have to stick with fossil fuels because fossil fuels are cheap. Fossil fuels are cheap only because the price of them is cheap because we make the price cheap. We make the price cheap because we take what we want, which is the oil, and we leave all of the problems to everybody else. The cost of fossil fuels is actually extremely high. The cost of coal, coal is cheap if you buy it, but the cost of coal is extremely expensive. It involves blowing the tops off of mountains, burying a few miners every now and then, creating millions of cases of asthma, changing the heat balance of the entire world, acidifying the oceans. Those are the costs, but they're nowhere in the price. Our system of exchange, which was developed in the 1200s, doesn't understand how the world works. It is out of sync with reality. So we say, well, we can't, we can't go to these clean energies that actually run the planet. They power the planet, the wind, the sun, the tides, the heat of the earth, those energies power the planet. We say they're too expensive, we have to stick with what's cheap. Well, we've crossed this kind of bridge before because the cheapest energy, the cheapest energy is slaves. Slaves are still cheap. What we understand now is that slavery is completely immoral. The energy we use today is also immoral. The difference is we don't understand that yet. 150 years ago, we fought to the death over this question of slavery because we didn't yet understand universally that it's just not acceptable. Maybe if we get through the situation we're in now, looking back 100 years from now, perhaps, people will understand it was unacceptable. The costs were much too high. The suffering was much too great. This is my neighbor feeding a gull on the roof of his house. And he used to feed that gull every day all summer. And one day the gull came with a bunch of grass and other fine nesting material in its bill and put that in his hand.
Okay, so what do we need to do? It's pretty simple what we need to do. We need to stop hating people because of what they believe. We need to understand that you can't keep growing on a planet that isn't growing. And we need to understand that you can't run civilization on energy that ruins the world. Those are the three things we need to know. But simple doesn't mean easy, it just means simple. But in our history, every time we've expanded the circle of compassion to include more and more people or more and more of the world in what we consider, we've always made the right decision. First it was only, you know, in decisions about people, first it was only white people who held, white men who held property. Then it was white men. Then it was men. Then it was men and sort of women. Now we have all these debates about gay people. Um, what about all the other animals? But every time we expand that circle, we make the right decision. Every time we emphasize our differences, we make the wrong decisions, some very hideous decisions. And so, although my lens has been through the ocean, it seems to me that at this point in our history, nature and human dignity require one another. Where people have been robbed of their dignity and um, don't have the luxury of caring about nature, they cannot get back up on their feet. You think of Haiti as an extreme example of that. They ruined all the nature there. They're really stuck in a very deep hole that they can't get out of by themselves. And um, where we do take care of the natural world, we give ourselves some room to consider how to live as human beings and what we should be doing and how we should be treating one another. So I think nature and human dignity rely on one another. Oops. Wrong direction. And I think it's important to have two things. One is hope and the other is inspiration. And my definition for those things is hope is the ability to see how things can get better. Hope motivates all work. If you can't see how anything can get better, then you can't do anything about it. But if you can, that's hope and that motivates work. And inspiration is the urge to act. So it's really important to see how things can get better and to feel the urge to act. And feeling hopeful and inspired is about the best thing that you can possibly feel. So that's my view. A lot of these ideas are in a book of mine called The View from Lazy Point. This is literally The View from Lazy Point. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And I want to thank you very much for being here today. <laughs>